the way I look at mid-October now is that you absolutely can kill some stuff during mid-October. And I want to keep hunting through mid-October. I'm not going to force it in the wrong places though. So on the back 40, for example, small property, 64 acres of which, you know, there's only a handful of spots within that 64 acres that are really, you know, where deer will move in daylight outside of like crazy rut stuff um, or like last of the daylight kind of stuff. So there's a lot that needs to be handled with white silk gloves is what I'm trying to say. If you push in there, you will blow the whole thing out very easily because there's not a lot of that good bedding cover. There's the central swampy ridgy edges of that where these deer were bedded. And you can very quickly have these deer want to spend their daylight hours elsewhere if you made them do that. Lights, camera. Follow the trail. Ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> Trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. All right, we're live and we have Mark Kenyon from Meat Eater Wired to Hunt here. And how's it going this morning, Mark? Good. It's good. I uh, just got back from a little scouting prep trip up at our family deer camp in northern Michigan uh, with my with my son and my dad. So coming off a really fun day and glad to keep talking deer. Cool. Yeah. So this is a fun one because I think uh, we have a mix of uh, items here to cover today and we are putting you through your own gauntlet. So get, get ready. Um, and we also have a I bunch of, coming. yeah. Um, and we have a kind of some other random questions um, as well. So we opened it up to some of our listeners as well. So kind of just a, a fun spectrum here to cover. And I guess if you're ready, we'll just kind of like start going right through it. Let's do it. All right. So I have to ask Chad put together a real interesting piece of content earlier this year of basically your career progression and like hunting progression. And I have to ask, what did you think about that watching, you know, watching that basically see yourself grow up in every aspect? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, um, I did see that. And at first I was like, this has got to be a hit piece. Like I was waiting, <laughs> I was waiting it for it to be like, and honestly, he gets his, uh, his skill set can because he sold his soul and his kidney. <laughs> right. Um, so at first I was terrified by it. And then it was, uh, embarrassing <laughs> to see those early videos of me, like painfully embarrassing. And I'm wondering how in the world did I manage to make it this far? If I sounded like that and was doing that stuff. <laughs> Uh, but then it was, you know, it was very nice and, and I appreciated that. And it was funny though. I was like, oh, this is actually, this is actually cool. But then I also felt like if I share it, it's like me tooting my own horn. Like, Hey, look at this thing. These people made that says nice things. So then I was like, I don't know what to do about this. And then I think life got crazy and I just kind of forgot, but, uh, but thank you guys for the, for the kind words in there. And it was really interesting to see. And it was actually kind of, you know, it's so easy to get wrapped up in the day-to-day -day stuff and you're just going a thousand miles an hour and it's always the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Uh, very rarely do you get kind of shook out of that enough to take a step back and look back and realize like, oh, wow, look at the, look at where you came from. So it was mm -hmm. actually a really great reminder to do that and uh, actually gave me a good reason to kind of appreciate that journey. So, so thanks for doing that. Yeah, Chad did a good uh, job there. Yeah, it was it was a cool little project to do. You know, we've um, we've started to put that wrinkle into some of our content. So we've been doing more of those hunter profiles and profiles on, you know, even specific deer and telling uh, a little bit of history or heritage around uh, the whitetail space. And that was that that was the first one that we did. And we we had a good time with it. There were some funny things and some <laughs> some old clips that, oh, uh, man. <laughs> that just made us you know, just made us laugh, like kind of in the office as we were kind of reviewing uh, where we were going to pull the content from. But oh, uh, yeah. we just wanted you to know we appreciate your work and, uh, you know, um, I guess the groundwork or, or pavement that you've laid um, for folks like us in, in the content space. So we appreciate it. Yeah, well, yeah. Much appreciated. And uh, you guys are doing some really cool stuff too. So keep that up. Thank appreciate you. it. So the, the next question that I have, so you started from basically ground zero, you know, and you were an independent media producer for a really long time. 
um, doing your own thing, freelance work, and then eventually joining forces with one of the biggest media companies in our space and arguably, you know, across many facets. What has that been like to go from completely independent to working with, you know, a larger team and, and larger missions? Yeah. I mean, it was a big step. It was a big change. Um, and leading up to it, it was definitely like the, the scariest, toughest decision I had to make. Um, you know, there was all these risks of losing autonomy, losing control of my baby, uh, you know, just going from being independent to all of a sudden working with a larger group and a large number of people and all those things. There was concerns around that. So I spent a whole lot of weeks and months debating it. Uh, but at the same time, it also presented these really exciting opportunities to work with some of the people that I thought were the the absolute best in the business and the folks I was looking up to and, and be able to maybe do some things that, you know, I would never be able to do on my own, uh, whether it be just because I had the support or the resources or people that I could work with, um, ideas, all that kind of stuff. The level of impact that I thought you could make by doing this was, was night and day compared to what I was doing independently. I could definitely see that I was kind of plateauing a little bit with what I was doing on my own. And whenever I feel myself plateauing, I always uh, try to, to shake out of that and figure, okay, what's the next thing I need to do? To, what's the next cliff I have to jump off of to make it to that next you know, step in my journey? Uh, so when this came about, it seemed like one of those types of situations where, yeah, it was high risk, but it was high reward. And I've always found in my own journey or whatever you want to call it, that whenever something scares me, whenever like there's two paths and one of them is the scary one, Usually that's a sign that that's what I'm supposed to do. And so I, I went towards the scary and, uh, and I'm glad I did, you know, over the last, it's been three and a half years now or something like that. And it has been definitely a good move. It's pushed me, you know, in so many different ways to grow. Um, I think I've learned a ton. I've had a lot of great experiences, got to work with some incredible people and, and kind of learn under some really great folks um, and, you know, have been able to, do stuff that there's no way I would have been doing otherwise. Um, so yeah, it's been exciting. It's been a ton of work. I mean, it's been wild and crazy and busy and all those things, but uh, the good kind. So sure. it's been, uh, it's been great from that perspective. And, and like a lot of those things that I was worried about, like, will I still have autonomy? Will I still have control of the things I care about? Um, it, you know, pretty much I've been able to maintain my hands on the things I really care about almost, you know, there's of course little things here and there. But for the most part, I really have been able to kind of run my own little thing within this larger landscape um, and offload some of the stuff I didn't want to do and get to focus just on the, the storytelling and the content and the teaching and all that, which is what I really love. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been it's been great. It's been it's been an interesting ride. And now, uh, you know, just we're on to on to new crazy stuff this fall. So it's uh, it's good. <laughs> Very cool. And then uh, we'll try make a transition into a slight hunting question. Are you still taking scent control with a very strict approach, like extremely strict to, to where it was in the past? Or have you relaxed that a little bit? Now, that is a hard pivot. That is a very hard pivot. <laughs> I know. We, gotta have to, we have to shift gears now. <laughs> um, so, yes-ish. Okay. Um. I would say I am still pretty rigid about it when I'm in controlled settings. So when I can do it, I still try to do just about as much as I possibly can. So I still am keeping my clothing washed and I keep it outside and I keep it in a sealed container. I don't get changed until I'm at the truck or at the property or wherever it is that I'm hunting. Um, so I still do all that stuff. I still use an ozone machine most of the time, an ozonics. I still use nose jammer on my boots. Um, that all is the same. Um, I'd say that the only thing that's maybe a little bit different is that I just don't stress out as much if some part of that system can't be in place. Um, because I've, I've seen that you certainly can't, like, you know, I, I do a lot of traveling hunts now and you just can't control your setting as much. You can't control how often you can take a scent free shower or how often you can wash your clothes or whatever. Um, and so what I've also kind of realized is that, and I think this goes across a lot of different facets of hunting. You know, I think it was like 15 years ago when I 
decided like, Hey, I really want to try to get better at this stuff. And I like dove into how to get better at deer hunting and, you know, decided to move away from just what I grew up doing and what my family did and instead like dive into it. And so early on, a lot of what I was learning was what so-and-so told me to do, right? It was what this magazine told me to do or what this guy on this video told me to do or whatever. And I took that stuff as like gospel truth. And if so-and-so from Michigan said, you got to do it this way, then you have to do this way. And if you don't do that way, you're screwing it up. You're not going to be able to get that buck and you're doomed, blah, 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 blah. So early on, I had a lot of those types of like lines in the sand within my own mind that I had to do it perfectly just like this. And what I have learned in my own, you know, experiences now over the last decade and a half, really testing a lot of these things is that there's a lot of truth when it comes to scent control, specifically back to that, there's a lot of truth in the fact that, you know, every little thing you can do right will help. And I am always about trying to, you know, focus on those little things and all those little things add up. And when it comes to scent control, I think it can help. I do not think, you know, you're never going to get it all the way. You're still going to get winded sometimes. But if I can get winded a quarter of the time less, that's still super beneficial. So I'm going to do as much as I can. But at the same at the same time, if I'm traveling to hunt and I can't do everything just right, and I know my scent regimen is not perfect, uh, is not as good as it could be, I'm not going to let that throw me off my game plan. You're going to still be playing the wind as best as you possibly can. You're still going to be really smart about how you access and where you walk and do all those things. And I know both from seeing and hearing from tons of people who've done it and from myself doing it, that you can still have plenty of success in that world too. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of shades of gray and you can make it work in any one of those. It's just a matter of finding out what fits for you. And so I've, I've found success in both kinds of versions of the scent control world. And so while I know one's ideal and I'm going to shoot for that as much as possible, I'm not going to let it get me down if I can't quite get there. Fair enough. That's yep. kind of what I assumed, but I wanted to hear it from you. So, Chad, do you want to kick off the the gauntlet here? Oh, let's do it. This is going to get good. <laughs> this is going to get good. I'm okay. Nervous. So, we know that um, you know you have a pretty jam packed schedule coming up for 2021. A lot of DIY public land stuff. Um, roughly ten white tail tags in your pocket. So, a lot of traveling, a lot of new areas. So we're going to kick this off with a very uh, specific scenario. It's early season. Um, food is the obvious destination for whitetails this time of year. You're in an area that you've been in for the last couple of days. You've had some okay hunts. You've had some decent hunts, seeing some younger deer, younger bucks, but a lot of deer sign. So again, this is public land and you're doing your best to get away from pressure, you know, walking way back in. Let's say you're walking two miles, two miles deep um, to what you think is a secluded food source for evening hunts. But you just can't seem to elude or escape human intrusion or human pressure. So in your first three or four hunts, you have some, some wasted hunts in there. Um, so at this point, this is on an eight-day hunt. You're 50% of the way in. Uh, what is your next move? Do you stay in the area and hope you can find uh, where the deer are, are moving to, to get away from that human pressure, or are you re relocating um, to a new area with only a few days left to, to fill your tag? Yeah. So I think it would have to be, if, if there was some stone left unturned that I had been afraid to go into leading up to that point. And if I knew there was like this honey hole that maybe I'd been like, going all around the edges of it and I was like man I know they gotta be in here and I've seen big rubs or maybe the night before opening day I saw a good one in there a couple good ones but now the first few days of the season now the hunting pressure has blown them in there and I can't get on them if there was still that spot still or a couple spots where I was like man they gotta be in there if I still believed there was that to to get into I would just dive into it I would I would swing for the fences and have that Hail Mary and actually push right into the interior because if they're there, even with hunting pressure, you know, if I'm confident there's something I'm interested in, it's worth taking a swing at before giving up entirely. Cause it's, it's going to be the same outcome either way, either I give up on it. I'm not going to get a shot at those deer or I get really aggressive and try to get tight to that bedding area and I blow it out. And then I don't get a shot at them anyway. So you might as well take the shot. 
But if I have really explored all my options and it's four or five days into the hunt and I'm down to the last couple and, you know, I keep on getting blown up by other people, I will just rip the bandaid off and go somewhere new. I've had to do this a couple of times um, where if it's, if it's not happening, what do they say? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over with the same results and expecting something different. Um, I've learned that sometimes a change of scenery can immediately, you know, change your, your luck, you know, being in the right area um, can be night and day. So there was an example where I was doing this on a, a hunt, I don't know, a handful of years ago, and we'd been hunting this river bottom area and there was people in there, like we weren't expecting, and we just weren't seeing the deer we wanted. And my buddy had been hunting a few days longer than I had, and he still hadn't seen a shooter. And I came in for a day and a half or two days. And so between the two of us, we had like five days there and just had not seen what we wanted. It wasn't panning out the way we wanted. And we had like tomorrow was our last day and it was the morning of the prior day. And so we're sitting there thinking, okay, do we just keep on hoping that something's going to show up or what's like the hard pivot we could take? And what I did is I pulled up Onyx and I zoomed out and I said, okay, here's like all the public land we have within two hours, let's say. And can we find something that would fit the system that we're trying to employ here? And this is an early season hunt, just like you're describing. And the system, like the, the easy way to pull it off in the early season is find somewhere where there's visible food and public land that has the cover and find somewhere where you can see a deer out feeding and just say, okay, actually, I know there are bucks that are feeding close to public land here. Let's get in the backside and hunt that public land where they're going to come back to bed. And if I could, if I could find somewhere that had that, um, then, you know, right away, like here's a system that works and we can confirm that there are deer and like we can do it and we can do it fast if we happen to find that. So it was kind of a high risk, high reward type situation. We would have to pull up stakes, drive across the state to a different part where, you know, it's, it might be completely different, but from the maps, it looks like, like this should work and there's a bunch of it. And so we did it. We, we, we packed up camp in like a crazy rush. And we, our goal was to drive up to this other part of the state and get there in time to glass the last hour of daylight. If we could do that, we could drive all over this area and glass all these different fields that butt up to different pieces of public land. And the hope was we'd find one. We'd find one that would have some deer and, and something we would be interested in hunting. And we would try it and maybe it wouldn't work out. And then we would have kind of wasted our time in that way, but maybe it would. And we did it. We made the drive. We got to the spot. We drove all over the place and lo and behold, we found one little green field that had a whole bunch of bucks in it and there was public land access on the backside. It was just like we wanted. So we saw them do that that night. The next morning we watched again, saw what they did and we slipped in there midday. Me and my buddy set up in two different parts where there's different deer coming in and out of this little food source. And we did not kill a deer, but we came as close as you possibly can to both of us feeling buck dead. Like we both had shooter bucks just out of range in like a one day kind of situation. So we went from having zero encounters or close calls in the five to six days prior to then, you know, almost both killed on the first day. And if we'd had more time, I'm sure we could have killed. I felt like it was definitely the right move and it made it for a fun, you know, change of pace, a fun adventure, a great encounter, an awesome way to, to finish off the hunt. So I'm definitely not afraid to, to, to do that hard move to change it up fast. If it's, if it's not working, I'm not going to pound my head against a brick wall. If I don't see a solution, if there's no solution and I'm just like wishing on a prayer, I don't wish on a prayer anymore. Yeah. I'm, I'm only going to hunt someplace and do something. If I really think like I'm doing it for a reason and there's a good solid chance that something can come up. I don't take just flyers for no reason anymore. There's gotta be a reason. And if I'm just sitting there because I've got two more days of my hunt and I don't really have any confidence in it. And I'm just like, ah, well, Maybe I'll get lucky. Uh, I'd much rather make my own luck. And so, so that's how I'd approach that. If you could go back in that specific moment in time or that specific hunt where the evening where you guys relocated and, and glassed those deer in that green food source, would you go in and hunt that bedding area or that cover the next morning if you could do that whole scenario over again? Would you hunt that next morning or would you still say, okay, we're going to glass those deer in the morning and make sure uh, they're headed back to bed? It's a good question. Um, I still think I would have stuck with what I did for that first morning just because we just didn't know what they were doing enough. And I felt really confident with the evening. Like I knew we could pull off the evening and I knew like this would be tough given the fact we didn't know anything about how they were operating other than what we just saw. I didn't know anything about 
how we'd be able to get in there in the morning. I never set foot in there. I never, uh, it would have just been very hard to pull off knowing we, we had like one chance. And if we go in there and screw up our one chance, you know, we don't have an opportunity for more chances. So I really wanted to have like a perfect setup and going in there blind in the dark, not knowing where these deer would be, knowing, could I get in there around the backside? Could I not? Is it going to be a disaster with all these creeks and sloughs and making all sorts of noise and those deer will be a hundred yards away and they'll spook and we'll never even get a chance. That just seemed like, yeah, you get more time in the field, but I, I still would much rather have a well thought through, well planned out strike um, versus twice as many hours. So in this case, um, no, I'm happy we did what we did. We had, we were able to get in there and have a damn good opportunity and we knew we could get in there safely in the evening. Now, if I had the next morning, I might have tried, I might have been able to get the, get away with the next morning now that we got in there and saw it and set up. Um, but I just think it, given the situation we had, it wouldn't have been smart to do it the first time. No, makes makes a lot of sense. Staying patient until you have uh, all the necessary MRI, I guess, and um, yeah. being aggressive when you have enough information to be aggressive. Yep. How many of these trips are you needing to make a hard pivot mid trip? When you say how many trips, like how many how many years of me trying this to get the compass well, to that? Well, no. Or? So let's say, for example, if you did five trips last year, how many of those did you have to make an extremely hard pivot and pick up camp and move somewhere else? out of those five or, you know, what a percentage of where it looks great on the map. You get there. It's not what you expect and pack up. We got to go somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, every year is different. Um, you know, this year, I think I'll have a lot of opportunity situations like that. You know, the last couple of years because of the back 40 thing I was working on, I just didn't travel as much to hunt because I was kind of locked into that. Um, so I didn't have as many, but I would say if I were to like look back over all my years of trips and travels and stuff and try to like, estimate what percentage I had that kind of thing happen. I don't know, maybe like a fifth of the time, something like that. Um, I think I, I try to go into any of these traveling hunts. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but I try to go into any kind of hunt like that with a good set of options, like a plan B and C and D so that I don't need to do the hard, like unknown shift so that at least if I'm doing a fallback plan, it's a, it's a plan. Sure. Fallback plan. But, you know, you, you get situations where sometimes you just realize that especially when it's new, this just is not what I thought. Um, and and even, you know, last year I did an Idaho hunt and public land whitetail. And even though we stayed in the same general area, uh, well, that's not entirely true. We had three different general areas, I guess. Um, I had to make a lot of hard pivots that were, weren't as drastic as that, but they kind of felt drastic in the moment. And it was just it felt a little bit like pinball, but at the same time you, you kind of, I'm getting to the point where you can feel you've seen something similar enough that, you know, when it's worth like keeping on pushing here or no, I'm, I'm like, I've, I've hit the wall. This is as far as it can be pushed. And, and now let's go find, let's keep on feeling our way down the wall. There'll be a soft spot somewhere. And that takes, I think some experience just knowing when to keep pushing versus when to shift and find that next window that you can push through. Uh, I don't have like a simple formula. I can tell you this, that's going to tell you, well, if you one and one is going to equal two and that's when you do this. Um, it's, it's much more of an intuition thing that I wish, uh, I wish I could explain. And maybe someday if I can ever really help explain that I'll, I'll make it. But uh, <laughs> until then <laughs> I'm just feeling it out. Got it. Okay. We ready to go on to the next scenario? Or next question, I guess. So with you, you know, moving throughout basically the country on 10 different, you know, tags in your pocket this upcoming year, will what you're seeing on the previous trip impact heavily as you go into the next date? So kind of in a hypothetical with uh, like migratory birds where you're following it all the way down south, what you're finding, you know, in one area of the country, this is what they were doing for this week. Maybe you're moving geographically where okay so if they were doing that there this week hopefully these deer will be doing the same thing this upcoming week or are you going in with kind of a clean slate for each trip did i, I, did I articulate that properly i follow okay. it okay all I right good it. enough <laughs> yes yeah. um i think there will be some of that in some of these circumstances um 
you know, I'd be foolish not to take whatever data I could from the previous days or weeks and, and try to apply it if it's relevant. So I will definitely be, you know, cataloging what I saw. And if I can pull from it the next time around, definitely. But I've got like a weird situation. I'll explain to you why my situation is a little weird. Um, these hunts aren't going to be normal hunts, how I would normally hunt. A segment of these trips, I will be kind of doing kind of what I do on the Wired Hunt podcast. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to meet with people who are like the best of the best of what they do in their unique region or area. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to spend a day or two and basically watch what they do and try to learn about what they do and dissect what they do and ask them all the questions I would ask them on the podcast. How do you do this? Why do you do this? What about this situation? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to try to soak up as much possible information as I can from them about how they do it. And then I'm going to take off for the rest of the trip and try to guinea pig it and see like, can I learn from what I just saw them do yesterday? And can I apply that over the next four days myself? Um, so I'm going to be hunting. I'm going to be trying to adopt all these different styles that I'm not comfortable with and do all these things I've never done before and see like, can I figure it out? What's this like in real life? You hear so-and-so talk about this thing. What's it actually like to try that thing in the place he's hunting? So because of that, it's going to be a little bit different um, in that I'll be forced into different styles. I'll be forced into using whatever it is that they're using versus whatever I did last week. So what I did last week or two weeks ago on that hunt will be in such a different place in such a wildly different situation from what I'm doing in this one. It, there will be some situations where just wanting to be relevant. So I'll use what I can, but I can also, as I'm thinking about it, I can see that I think every time I land in a new spot, I'm going to be starting kind of from square one Mm -hmm. and in like this wildly different situation. So it's going to be a really interesting, tough challenge. Um, and I'm kind of looking at this season, even though, like you said, Chad, I've got 10 buck tags this year. I'm not super worried about filling them all. Or I mean, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to fill them all, but I'm not going <laughs> to stress about filling almost any of them. I'm looking at this as like a real life masterclass educational opportunity where I'm going to try to go learn from like these masters and probably like I do in so many situations fail miserably trying to like do it myself, but I'm going to learn a shit ton along the way. And, uh, and that's going to be really cool. So it's going to be a very different season in that regard. Like a lot of what I've been doing over past years is hunting my own local stuff and doing it my own way. Um, I want to try to take that like learning thing that I try to do on podcasts and apply it in real life and see what that's like. So, so that's my unique 2021 season. I got to imagine, um, with those hunts lined up, you're going to be in a, just the, the widest, broadest range of terrain and habitat imaimaginable. Would that, would that be a correct assumption? Like from yeah, the Northeast I mean, to the Midwest, Maine, Maine, Texas, Washington, DC, Nebraska, Idaho, Iowa, Arkansas, uh, Wisconsin. So, I mean, yes, just about every corner and type of whitetail habitat and style, we're going to touch it. Is there any of that habitat or terrain that you are, I guess, unfamiliar or novice with? Is there anything that you haven't touched yet in your, in your career? Um, I've touched like little bits and pieces of probably almost everything, but I mean, Texas will be very far outside of anything I've ever done. And this will be like West Texas hill country, big open stuff, not any like the fenced in stuff. Um, but it'll still like, that's like that scrubby Texas stuff. That'll be very different. Um, I'll be hunting in like the city suburbs, which will be pretty different. I did some like suburb hunting when I was a kid, when I first learned to bow hunt, my parent, we grew up on a three acre property and it's kind of a neighborhood. And so I bow hunted that, but I've not done it like in a really tight neighborhood with people all over the place. Um, so that'll be very different. Um, and then, you know, I've got a couple hunts that will be entirely big woods and i've done some big woods but that's definitely the thing i've done the least of or at least least successfully i've done a lot of big woods hunting up in northern michigan uh but usually it's been this good an exercise in futility so i think uh, i'm particularly excited to do that and learn from some people that have found success in that situation more consistently than i have uh so yeah i'm i'm, I'm interested in that sure well um Let's get into the next uh, specific scenario. Um, 
let's move over to the back 40 piece, the back 40 project. So it's mid October. You've had a bunch of bucks uh, located throughout the summer in the area. But as again, as we get around that so-called October law period, the activity starts to dwindle down. It seems like the most of the activity under trail cameras are at night. Okay. At this point, are you getting aggressive to locate bucks this time of year? Or are you holding off for a, you know, a cold front? Um, are you looking for action to pick up on your cameras before you make a decision? Uh, what, what's your thought process and what's the strategy there? Yeah. So like you said, mid-October, a lot of people like to talk about that as a tough time, quote unquote, lull, so on and so forth. At the same time, though, there's definitely like another segment of the hunting community that says, screw that, dive in deep, kill them in their beds. You can do it. Uh, and there's truth to both of those. Uh, I think it comes down to knowing what your circumstances are and what is tenable in it. And so the way I look at mid-October now is that you absolutely can kill some stuff during mid-October. And I want to keep hunting through mid-October. I'm not going to force it in the wrong places, though. So on the back 40, for example, small property, 64 acres of which, you know, there's only a handful of spots within that 64 acres that are really, you know, where deer will move in daylight outside of like crazy rut stuff um, or like last of the daylight kind of stuff. So there's a lot that needs to be handled with white silk gloves is what I'm trying to say. If you push in there, you will blow the whole thing out very easily because there's not a lot of that good bedding cover. There's the central swampy ridgy edges of that where these deer were bedded. And you could very quickly have these deer want to spend their daylight hours elsewhere if you made them do that. So I would approach a small property like that, of which an even smaller portion of it is really huntable, um, carefully. So for me, if I was just hunting that place on my own and doing it the way I want to do it, I would take a couple good stabs early season. If it didn't work out early season, I would lay off but be monitoring things. So either with some careful trail camera poles or cell cameras to be keeping tabs on, you know, is there a flyer, like a buck that does start moving in daylight when you wouldn't think him, that he would? If that happens, yeah, I'm going to, you know, if there's daylight activity from a buck I'm after, that's instantly, forget what time of year it is, forget what the rule book says, like you get after him. Um, if a really significant cold front came through, I would definitely take, you know, some kind of stab. I wouldn't necessarily super aggressive stab, but I'd get in there and give it a shot. Um, Otherwise, I would kind of monitor and stay back until one of those two things happened or that like last seven to 10 days of October arrives. I really like that last portion of October for getting in there again. Um, that said, I wouldn't stop hunting. I would just go and put that pressure in other places. So hopefully I've got other places I can hunt or that'd be a time I'd go do a traveling hunt. Or if I don't have that, hopefully there's some public land around and I'm going to keep on hunting and I can do crazy fun, aggressive stuff on the public land where I can experiment, learn some new stuff, maybe kill a deer. Um, but I don't need to be putting that aggressive pressure in this little spot that I really need to be careful. But I also know that if I am careful and I wait till the right time, you've got a great chance. So, so that's what I would do. I would be safer on the back 40 until something really screamed at me to do it or, you know, October 25th or 26th arrived or something like that. And then I'd go hunt some public land. And if I was hunting public land at that time, I would be aggressive getting into that cover, getting tied to where I think those deer are bedded, um, bumping around, exploring stuff uh, and, and trying to make something happen. I think when you have a tiny property, like, like the back 40, you need to wait until the thing is going to happen naturally and, and take advantage of it when it does. When you're hunting new stuff or public land stuff, lots of times I find you gotta, you gotta make it happen aggressively. Um, and if it doesn't work out, that's fine. Cause you can go to the next spot, go to the next spot, go to the next spot. So that that's kind of the balancing act I would try to ride. What are some of those screaming indicators that you mentioned aside from, you know, those marquee dates coming up, but like, what are, what exactly are you looking for? Yeah. So it'd be the daylight trail camera photos. So if a buck I'm interested in targeting shows up on camera, that's a go time. If a cold front pushes through, that's, you know, to really be really excited about it, it needs to be at least like a 15 to 20 degree temperature drop. Um, if you were getting like an early season snow or something, or if there was five days of rain 
and temperature plummets. And then that first day the rain peters out and the wind peters out and it's just crisp, cool day and bluebird skies or something. That'd be a day like, dang it. I gotta, I gotta take a shot. Now those Mm -hmm. kinds of days would be something where, um, it's worth a flyer. Uh, otherwise I'm going to wait and just hunt elsewhere. With the back 40 and, um, you know, with your, I guess, trail camera strategy, now that you've been on the parcel for a few years, have some history with some specific deer, you have some data that's been cataloged. How much are you paying attention to, I guess, the historical data around those daylight activities in October from, you know, previous bucks? Is that something you pay attention to at all? Or is that something that you just think is hearsay and you just um, go with an MRI? Yeah, you know, I definitely think there is something to it. I've seen enough times on other properties I've hunted that there can be a kind of a method to the madness. And if bucks show up in certain spots at certain times in previous years, um, it's not guaranteed to do it again, but there's a better chance that they might than else than otherwise. So yes, I would definitely key in on that. If, if, if the other stars align. So for example, on the back 40, there was a period of a really great, daylight activity from a number of different relatively mature bucks just on kind of the edge of some of these like staging bedding area type spots that I had cameras running last year in that last third of October. So it started around like the 19th, maybe the 20th and ran till about Halloween. Like maybe the best activity of the whole season was during that 10 day period. And I wasn't hunting there at all um, because we had, we had scheduled times to film. Um, so if I was hunting there again this year, which, which I can't hunt there this year, cause we, we gave it away. But, um, <laughs> if I was hunting again this year, I'd have that circle on my calendar as like, I think there's probably a reason why that was happening. And, you know, maybe it was a doe coming into estrus early. Right. And oftentimes these does, like that's a genetic thing. Like, so that same doe, if there's a doe family group in an area and you find out that, man, this herd for whatever reason, there's usually like one of these does or a couple of these does that comes in early every year. Um, that's something that can repeat itself. And so there's another spot in Michigan where I found the same thing, like every year. And this hasn't happened to me other places, but on this property, like around the 23rd, 24th, 25th, somewhere in that ballpark, it gets going. Like, I don't care what's happening. It always gets going early in this spot. And I've, I've realized that now. And so now I plan on like, my rut type hunts in this area start like a week early on that property because there seems to always be one. And so I, I do watch for that and I don't um, live and die by it. I'm not going to go in there, like assuming like, absolutely this box going to show up on the same day again, the same place, but I certainly will look for those trends or if such and such buck showed up, you know, I will try to plan to take advantage of a couple day window in there. Like if he showed up on October 25th last year and the year before that, his first daylight was October 27th. I'm certainly going to go in there this year thinking, all right, man, late October is when he shows up in daylight the last two years. I need to have a plan in place to you know, take advantage of that, assuming he'll do something similar. So let's make sure I've got a way to collect whatever MRI is possible to confirm that. And when the wind's right or whatever, I can get in there and take that stab with the data I collected over these years combined with what's happening right this instant. What was something that surprised you after you scooped up that project and you worked on it for two years? Um, Was it easier or harder than what you thought to have an opportunity to have at a, you know, a mature Michigan buck each year? Um, It was definitely harder in year one than I expected. Um, it was harder to find a place. First off, I, I thought I'd always thought that, man, as soon as you, as soon as I had the money to buy a little farm, it'd be a piece of cake to get the place you want. And I just thought those things were growing on trees or something, but we finally had the ability to like find a farm we wanted to buy for this project. And I had a really hard time finding anything that checked the boxes I was looking for. So that was the first thing that surprised me. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, uh you know, I'd done a little bit of habitat improvement on a couple of permission properties. I dabbled in it and been able to do some little food plots and stuff, but I never really had the ability to do like large scale stuff and like have a blank canvas. And with the back 40, all of a sudden I had that and I had, you know, people to help me a little bit and I had some resources to do stuff. And, um, a, it was just intimidating a little bit. Like once anything is possible, 
how do you actually choose what to actually focus on and where do you put your time and energy right away? All those things were just more difficult than I thought. And finally, it was just harder to pull off. Just, there were so many things that failed. There were so many things I tried and didn't work out. There was so much equipment that gave me a hard time. <laughs> um, so everything in year one, I think, surprised me. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought like simple things like putting a damn food plot and deer will come out and eating it. Like that's the kind of simple thing that usually works. And I couldn't even get that to work in the first year. <laughs> Um, so year one surprised me a lot in that regard. Year two surprised me on the other side, which was how quickly you can change things when you do get it right. And so year two, I I changed like our program dramatically, did it a lot different, tried to take everything that failed the first year and tried to fix it, tried to, um, tried to change a lot and learn a lot from that first year. And in one year with that set of changes, um, you know, we saw a night and day difference in the number of deer in general that's, that hung out on the property, the number of, you know, relatively mature bucks that were spending time on the property, the amount of daylight activity. Um, I mean, it was just, it was really a light switch event. And well, so, yeah. What were some of those changes that you did that made so much of a difference? Yeah, I think um, a big one was adding diversity structure and cover to the old fields. So the back 40 is like, like a swamp that runs through the middle. And then the other 50% of the property was old ag fields, which when we bought the farm, were just overgrown in uh, mare's tail, which is like a invasive weed that once fall arrives and the leaves come down, they're just like beanstalks with nothing, no food, no cover, nothing. So it was like a, a wasteland across 30 acres of our property that I found in year one, the deer hardly ever wanted to touch it all. So in year two, I needed to find a way to visually break that up. I couldn't have a bunch of eight acre fields that nothing would cross because that was most of our property, right? So I needed to add visual structure and cover that would make deer feel safe out there, that would make deer move around in there, that would make deer even maybe bed in some of those spots. Um, And then I wanted to add diversity to it as well so that there was also you know, food value out there. So it was also, you know, deer and all wildlife crave diversity. They want a lot of different options. And it was a desert of the same in year one. So in year two, we planted strips of sorghum and Egyptian wheat throughout a number of different parts of these fields to visually break it up, like big walls of stuff that basically looks like corn. We put walls of corn kind of that compartmentalized what was an eight acre field all of a sudden into little like one acre sections that no deer could see out of. So they would feel... Like they're in a small opening versus a really big opening. And then all of a sudden we added this, uh, you know, just like a deer might like to follow a a fence row because they like to follow edges. Well, now we added all this edge inside the field. We add all this structure that deer could bed next to or stand next to and feel safe. And then we also um, used herbicide to try to knock out as much of that mare's tail as we could in the spring and allow whatever's native there to grow back. And so we got all this native diversity that came out. So I went from just mare's tail to now like I don't know, 15 different species of all kinds of stuff. So it was thicker. It was more food. There was more cover value. We planted some switchgrass in there too, to provide kind of a base of cover. Um, so those fields were just transformed. And then we added food as well in food plots. So in year one, my food plot plan was let's have these like tiny little micro plots that are in the middle of these fields, like as far away from the edges as possible, because I was very paranoid about getting in and out without spooking deer. And I was worried if I make these food plots too big, there's no way we'll be able to get in and out. We're just going to be spooking deer all the time. And I came into it with this assumption that this property would be like other Southern Michigan places I hunt with just like tons of deer. So I was assuming like there'll be 20, 30 deer coming out and feeding in these plots. And so I had to make them really small because of that. Well, in year one, we saw like no deer. And we never had issues spooking deer out of these food plots because nothing was ever out there. And we had no reason for deer to spend time on ours is what it started to feel like. So in year two, I almost, I think we three X the size of our food that we added, maybe a little bit more than that and use the screening cover and the improved field to just, uh, to, to seclude them. So it still felt kind of secluded and I still had, somewhat stealthy ways to get in and out and around those without spooking deer, but much, much bigger food sources in there. And with those two things together, all of a sudden, a lot more deer activity in there. And they still stayed in the daylight and still used it. We're able to, you know, carefully, we had to get in and out carefully and we did not hunt a lot, 
but we had a reason for those deer to spend time. They had to cover the structure and now great food and enough of it to, for this to all of a sudden be like, Oh, Hey, this is like a, this is a good spot to be. And mm-hmm. that, that seemed to make a difference too. Interesting. And real, real quick, what were some of the boxes on that checklist when you were looking to find this piece? Yeah. Um, so probably the biggest thing was that I wanted some kind of sanctuary. Um, at least what I found in Michigan is that if you want to have a chance at mature bucks on a consistent basis, there's got to be some kind of sanctuary, some kind of reservoir where these bucks can make it past their first year or two. Um, the farms that I've hunted in the past that are just like normal farmland with some timber, some crops and guys everywhere. Um, it's year and a half olds. It's two and a half year olds. It's very, very hard to find anything older than that. But if you can find a property where there's a big nasty swamp or where there's a nature conservancy property on one side that nobody's allowed to hunt or a girl scout camp or something like those spots, you've got a reason and a way that a buck could make it through a couple of gun seasons. So Mm -hmm. I had to have something like that. That was the number one. You got to have a a way that these bucks, there's got to be like a superpower that's going to allow this buck to survive. And so in this case, there was this big swamp system. Love me a big swamp system. Those bucks can burrow down in those places and and survive a gun season or two. So that was a big one. Another one was, I, I just, you know, you're looking for a basic set of habitat criteria that would appeal to deer and deer hunting. So I wanted diversity in terrain. I didn't want 60 acres of just timber. I didn't want 60 acres of just field. I wanted a mix. So this property checked that box really nicely because it had the swamp, it had field, it had some timber and some fence row. So it gave us a, a nice set of options when it came to hunting and to you know improving habitat because that was something coming into it. Like we wanted to have something we had, could, could do some interesting new things with and having diverse options certainly did that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then a third really important thing was that I was looking for the right neighborhood. So I was trying to find, in addition to some kind of sanctuary thing, I was also looking for an area where I thought there would be other like-minded people. Uh, Because again, I was hoping that, you know, we could have some better deer hunting, some quality deer hunting. And in Michigan, that's not a guaranteed thing everywhere. So you need to find these little micro neighborhoods of people who are into that. So I did a lot of looking at like QDM co-op maps and looking uh, and talking to folks in the area. I did some like social media stalking and stuff, sure. like even like looking up neighbors on Facebook and trying to like look at the deer they're killing, the pictures they're posting, that kind of stuff. And so I was able to find a spot where there was, there was a QDM co-op in the area. There was a couple people where I talked to a friend of a friend and they said, well, actually this guy, I know that guy's name, he manages for such and such. And so I was able to find um, that kind of deal. And I, I'd done that in a number of the other properties we'd looked for. And I found a couple of these other neighborhoods that would be great um, or would be promising, I guess. Um, this one was just the one that all the pieces lined up. Interesting. So how long, yeah, how, if you had to quantify it, how long did it take to actually find this farm? It was probably four months. Gotcha. Um, I, we, I started looking, I think in January and we didn't close on that farm till it was like the last day, of April or first day of May or something like that. Um, and I think I walked, if I remember right, I think I walked 13 or 14 different properties. I walked in person mm-hmm. and then I can't, I mean, dozens of more that I looked, you know, studied online and looked at maps and pictures and talked to people about and all that kind of stuff. There was one farm I wanted to put an offer in on that got like pulled out from underneath us at the last moment. Um, so that was, a, that one almost happened, but that day it, it was funny that day I was trying to put an offer on this one farm and then the realtor got back to me and said, Oh yeah, this other guy did it already. And in my frustration of that moment, I was so pissed and it's like April. I'm like, God, we've lost our whole spring. This is never going to happen. Um, I just need to go for a drive. And so I had had a list of properties that were like C level options that I wasn't even going to go visit, but I just put on my list anyways. And I'm upset. And I thought, ah, I'll just drive out to this property that I don't even, this isn't going to be any good, but I don't know. I just want to go walk a property and maybe it'll surprise me. And so when I drove out to go look at that property and just kind of air out my frustration, I see that there's a for sale sign on the neighboring property. Mm. And I pull that up and that had not showed up on any of the internet databases. It hadn't showed up in any of my searches. Um, I pull up Onyx and look at that one. I'm like, huh, (laughs) this one this one's got something going for it and turns out it was, it was the back 40. So a little bit of a serendipity there. Yeah. Was it, uh, was it just listed by like a local brokerage that didn't have it 
fed through all the syndications. Yeah. They did the absolute worst job marketing it ever. <laughs> ever. I mean, horrible. It was, uh-huh. we ended up finding, like they had a listing for it on like their brokerage website. No, and not. there was one picture of it in one sentence, like good hunting or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if these guys had an ounce of sense, they could have marketed <laughs> the heck out of this property, positioned it as a recreational deer hunting property and probably sold it for three times what we bought it for. Sure. Um, so these poor guys didn't know what they had. <laughs> that seems to happen. I mean, that that's that story seems to to follow quite a bit. Uh, the pro- mm-hmm. the property getting swept out underneath you right before it, and then yeah. obviously finding a, a screaming deal after doing a lot of homework. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So should we dive into our uh, November scenario here? Okay. Game. Okay. Chad, you want to read it? Yeah. You're doing a good so- job. At it. <laughs> <laughs> So we're, we are um, in the Great Plains. So a lot of CRP, fallow field type um, habitat, maybe gently rolling hills, uh, waterways, uh, large timber, but the timber itself is basically only located in, in creek bottoms or, or, um, or fence rows. So limited timber, but it's there. So it's the first week of November. We'll say it's somewhere between the first and the fifth. Um, and you see a buck that you think is a pretty good one and he's bedded down with a doe and you're glassing him from, let's say a half a mile, three quarters of a mile away. And you see him go with the doe bed down. It's around 10 AM. Um, weather conditions. It's a crisp morning. It's cool. We'll say it's 30 degrees, uh, a high of we'll say 42 minimal wind. What do you do that day to get on that deer? Okay. Um, well, as you were describing the scenario, the first thing that came to mind was something that I've never actually pulled off, but I have been willing to try it more often, which is trying to actually stock up on a bedded buck and a doe like that and, and get a shot of them and you know, just, just hunker up right there. But when I hear almost no wind, crisp, loud, that tall grass, that's a really, really hard situation to pull off. Um, the next thing that comes to mind to me is, um, you know, in those kind of great plane situations, you've got great visibility. And it's also usually relatively simple to understand like what, what point A and B is. And then that doe, right, is going to still be wanting to go from a bedding type area to some kind of food source in the evening. So I know that she's going to want to go to feed somewhere that evening. And I also know that you can make some assumptions on how the safest route would be for them to travel that way. So what I would probably try to do would be to get out of where I was hunting right now and get out ahead of them to where I think they're going to start navigating into the evening hours. So make an assumption about, okay, I think they're going to want to head back to this cut cornfield or something by the end of the day. And so I'm going to see where they're bedded. I'm going to get out of my stand and reposition in a place that I can intercept them. Now, what I would probably do is, you know, you might be able to, depends maybe they're going to use some kind of low cut in the hills and work their way there but there's a good chance that they might work one of these edges one of these little draws of timber and work that on their way back to feed somewhere for the doe to feed and that buck's not going to leave that doe side uh so if that's the case i'd set up my saddle in one of those little tree lines of that draw where i think i could cut them off making their move but i would also have a really good plan I'd be prepared and like ready and locked and loaded for as soon as I see them make a decision on what they're doing for the evening. And if I see that they're not going to come my way and instead they're going to angle out somewhere else, I will have already mapped out in my mind visually how I'm going to get my bow out of the tree, how I'm going to get down on the ground and how I'm going to get the spot and stock sneak to sneak off to wherever I need to, to intercept them on the ground. Um, I had to do this in Michigan last year, trying to kill a buck. And, and almost pulled it off doing this, where I spotted him with a doe, locked on that doe. I thought I was in a spot where I originally set up in a spot I thought would intercept them. They didn't. They went the other way to go the opposite side of this field. And so I thought to myself, I'm like, well, I can just sit here and twiddle my thumbs, knowing that this buck and doe are going off in the other direction. And I don't want to kill any other deer. So I can just do that. And in a previous life, 10 years ago, I would have just sat it out. I'm like, ah, well, it happened. And maybe I'll get lucky. Uh, I don't wait for that luck anymore. So I got out of the tree and I hightailed it, even though it was, it was hard to move quietly. 
I hightail it to try to get out and do a big loop around and get ahead of them and get to at least the closest I could possibly get to where I thought they might end up. And uh, in that situation, got to within about 80 yards of them. They circled back in and just cut across just a little bit too far ahead of me. And, and that was that. But at least I was in the game. So I would do the same thing in this situation. I would be set up to hope that they would come back the way I set up on them um, because that, that doe is still probably going to want to try to go out to that food source and he'll probably follow her. And then if they, if they're moving off in another way, I know that in that tall CRP type stuff, at least visually, I'll be able to get away with quite a bit. So I will try to use the visual cover to get out ahead of them, get within range of where I think they'll eventually pass through and, and hope that you can find a way to do that and not spook them audibly. That would be, that would be my take. So with that visual sighting um, being at 10 o'clock in the morning, obviously there's a, a pretty large time span there before they move off to their evening food source or their, their evening movement. So how long are you keeping a, would you keep a visual on them before you got up and actually made that move to your evening, evening setup? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and one that I'm sure I'd sit up in the tree and like debate it for a long time. I'd be like, should I go? Should I leave? And like, as soon as you decide to pull down, there's the risk of them moving. you right. Um, what I would, what I have done when I've had this situation happen a couple other times is I will probably wait until like one or two. I'd wait until after midday because I've definitely seen that like late morning or midday, there's a move around, there's a shift. Um, but like wherever they're at, at like two or three o'clock, give or take, of course there's ex exceptions, but generally I feel like wherever they're at two or three o'clock, there's a pretty good darn chance. That's probably where they're going to be until five o'clock or four o'clock when they get up and start brewing. So it'd be right at that point, that sweet spot. I'd be watching them all the way till then. And if they're still there, then I would do this mad dash to get down, make my move and hopefully be set up again, you know, ready to take advantage of that movement you know, an hour later or whatever it is. I think that's what I would do. Right. Um, so one other scenario kind of within that, those same parameters uh, with one, I guess, one difference, the wind speed picks up to 15 plus miles an hour. And I think I know the answer, but how does your strategy change with the wind speed increased? Yeah. So if the wind is, is significantly higher, all of a sudden the stock becomes a possibility. And then it is reading the terrain and like how that buck and doe are situated, how the terrain lays out. And I need to make a judgment call of, can I actually get within range? You know, let's say there's some roll to those hills and I've got that CRP grass and maybe like there's a little coolie, like a little cut that I know I could drop into and like navigate right to 30 yards, but be behind this little uh, shelf all the way until I'm there. And if I know I'd have that and I could use the sound cover to get there, and then just creep up that side and be standing up above them. If there's a terrain situation that I think would allow me to do it, I'd go for it. Um, especially like, especially if this is a, you know, a public land or even a by permission, but like a short hunt, if this is like a seven day hunt, um, I'm swinging for the fences on anything like that. And if it's like a single specific buck I'm after, I would also be that aggressive. Even if this is like my local stuff, like I described last year, if there's just that one buck I'm after and he's there, uh, I'm not, I'm not afraid to be aggressive because he's, he's there. I'm not missing out on some other deer. I might be able to get a shot at by being more conservative and waiting in the other primo spot. No, I'm going to go after him. Um, I think the only reason I wouldn't go after him is if like, if there's something with the way the terrain sets up that I just don't see any way I can get in on him. So imagine, I don't know, maybe if they're at the bottom of a grassy bowl and there's no way to approach it except for from above in a highly visible place, but, it, but you're not within range at that point. If there was something like that, then I would just go back to that plan. A. Got it. Okay. I think there's uh there's one more specific yeah. scenario we want to run you, run you through. Um, this one may be a little bit selfish uh, of, for someone here in this office. I'm not going to say any names, but so this is um, another public land scenario, big woods. So very limited ag. Um, it is in hill country, very rugged, steep terrain. Um, let's say you're hunting like a world-class caliber animal. So by far Boone and Crockett easily, let's say he's teetering that, you know, that 200 inch mark. I'm stressed out for you already. <laughs> well, it's not me. So. Hypothetically. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's not me. Um, 
So this is a deer you got a ton of history with, right? You have trail camera pictures and history with this deer. Um, as a three-year-old, you've had previous encounters. You've had you, you have uh, a couple sheds from this deer. Um, so the the history is plentiful. It's there. Um, you've been tracking historical data, the sightings, trail camera pictures, everything, doing all the homework you could possibly do, um, all the digital scouting. I mean, you've really tried to dial this deer in. So in a specific area, this deer seems to be showing up um, in late September, comes to a primary scrape, uses that primary scrape through October. And we'll say the later part of October, we'll say like the 21st, the 24th, 25th, somewhere in there. Um, the previous year, you have daylight photos of him, late September, October 7th after a rain event, and then um, midday in, on October 24th. Now, again, deer's five or six years old. It's public land. Um, and this specific area is a day's travel from your home. So this isn't an area you could just pop in and bebop, you know, after work or an early morning hunt. Um, I mean, it, there's some dedicated travel here. So you make the trip down opening day with a cold front banking on that deer being in that general area. There's white oaks in the area. Um, so there's a, you know, a consistent, solid, attractive food source, plus a primary scrape, plus bedding opportunity. So you make the trip down opening day and that deer you hunt, you hunt, um, let's say you hunt the regardless of where you hunt, whether it's a scrape or it's the, you know, closer to the bedding area, you hunt opening day, no encounters. But that night after you leave, you get a cell camera photo of that deer uh, in front of your stand 30 minutes after you leave. And for sure, that deer has caught your ground scent from your exit walking out of there. What is your next move? Hmm. Yeah, it's a doozy. Um, I think that in that scenario, I would say that he got my ground scent. He knows I'm there, but he's also there for a reason. That buck's there for a reason. He survived to five or six years old for a reason. He is here on public land because he likes something about this spot. He's found a safe zone. He's found a safe way of living. So I would not abandon my general area but i would say okay knowing that he knows that there was a human here what's the fallback plan he would how would he react to that my assumption is that this buck will continue doing what he's generally doing but maybe adjust his travel just a little bit to avoid that specific spot um and so i think i would try to take what you can from that historical knowledge and from how he approached knowing that he got to your place 30 minutes after dark um, and then just back it up a little bit further. So knowing he got there 30 minutes after dark, you want to push a little bit closer to where you think he's bedded, I would say. And I don't think he's out of the country at all. Um, and heck, you know, depending on how much pressure is here, maybe he doesn't even care that much. Maybe he'd say, well, you know, I'm just going to react a little bit, but this is kind of the way the world is out here. He's going to smell people every once in a while. So I don't know that. I don't know like the level of, intrusion they accept there but my assumption would be to I, I take another stab at him probably the next day even uh, if I'm gonna pressure him and I made the trip uh, two stabs isn't gonna be that much different than one stab so I would push again but I push tighter to that bedding area um, and hope that I can catch him closer to that point because now I just got a very important piece of data like you don't need to look at it just as bad news it wasn't a horrible thing that happened that he winded that he caught your ground scent you learned like hey he was here he is still here he was here not that far away from daylight um so add that to the data set and then use that hopefully to be the final piece that can push you just a little bit closer to where he actually is um i think that would be i think that'd be what i would do what do any more do? do you have any more caveats at chat or or um, no, I, I mean, I think, uh, I think that's the gist of the, of that general scenario. Um, did this happen it, last year? It did happen last year. And what did Jake do? Oh, uh, this isn't for me. So Jake, <laughs> um, oh uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Jake, Jake moved in and did exactly what you said. Jake moved in, <laughs> um, and hunting closer to bedding. 
uh, the deer did not show. He went down the following cold front, which was, as if you remember, 2020, we had, it seemed like solid cold fronts every week. Yeah. So he proceeded to make the trip to that specific area every week to scout, run trail cameras, search for that deer because the deer had never showed back up after that night. Yeah. Until January. Wow. And with three previous years of history, that deer had been there um, on a really consistent basis. And so no one, no one killed him. He's still alive. So there's a little, there's a little ca- caveat there. Jake had gotten wind of uh, <laughs> another 200 inch deer being killed <laughs> November 14th or 15th in that area. So at that point, um, while he was there, he thought the gig was up. You know, how many 200 inch deer are, you know, in an area like that? Um, turns out that the deer was still alive, but uh, had just voided the area completely, which was a little bit different than, you know, the previous several years of, of history um, that we've had or that he had with that deer. So the saga, Man. I get, I guess the saga continues, right, Jake? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, whoever, whoever the hell is hunting this deer, I hope it comes <laughs> together. <laughs> Yeah, I think every one of the office agrees too. <laughs> <laughs> a strange one. Yeah. Big woods. Um, okay. Not so that easy. kind of, yeah. So that kind of concludes our scenarios. And now we're gonna jump to rapid fire questions as you may uh, be familiar with. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so yes or no. Um, does the moon phase carry any weight in your decision to hunt or not? No. No. Okay. Was that ever persuaded or has that moved like throughout <laughs> yeah, your that's time? Moved. That's yeah. moved. Okay. I've, I've, I, for a while, like I've always been like curious about it and I like, I watch it and I, I'm intrigued by it, but I get less and less. I, I'm more and more. It's not going to really influence me. I'm always interested. And in, like, if the moon happens to be good, I'm like, Oh, maybe it'll be even better today, yeah. Yeah. but it really doesn't impact what I do. Okay. Well, would you take a 50 yard shot at a buck with a bow? No. What's been the consensus with the people that you've talked to? Would you say more people say yes or no to that question? I think it's pretty 50, 50. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe. Yeah. I think 50, 50, a little bit depends on how do I say it? I won't say anything. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Fair enough. Okay. There's some people where you can just tell like, Oh yeah, they're, they're flinging it no matter what. (laughs) And then there's, then there's the types like, okay, they're a little more conservative. I'm definitely more conservative on that. And I, I don't like, missing or wounding deer it's it's happened enough times that i never want to experience it again so sure okay what's the furthest you shot and killed a buck or shot at a buck with a bow uh white tail longest shot i've shot and killed a buck was 43 yards getting pretty close no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay so you can only take one with you to the stand for the rest of your hunts are you taking a grunt tube? Okay, all right. <laughs> I what about that question cuz I just listened to the Adam Hayes episode uh yeah. recently and he was rattling antlers and then I mean is that another 50-50 or would you say it's more grunt tube? I think more grunt tube on that. Yep. Yeah. And I'm a hard like easy yes grunt tube for sure for me. Easy decision. Okay. A fixed blade or mechanical broadheads? On this one I go back and forth on all the time. Uh, but I, I generally use a mechanical more often. Interesting. Why is that in your opinion? So my take, I, I know the knock on both. I know the knock on possible failure with mechanicals, especially if you're hitting the shoulder blade. I know the knock on fixed blade being like the good thing about fixed blades that can power through stuff. Uh, but it also is much harder to tune and get to fly just like your field points. I would rather put it in the right place more often um, and have it be a slam dunk than, you know, plan for the worst case scenario and plan for an errant shot. I'm going to plan for a good shot. That's going to be the best case there. I want something more accurate. I'm not good enough of a fine tune tuning pro. I'm not the gear guy that can tune stuff perfectly Mm -hmm. to like get my field or to get my, to get a fixed blade to be like a sniper bullet. That's mm-hmm. not me. Uh, I need the dummy version of gear and mechanical is the dummy version. The best way I know I can get an accurate shot. That's going to be close to everything I've practiced with field tips. Um, and I just, you know, actively avoid that shoulder and, you know, knock on wood. I've never had a bad experience. Interesting. Okay. Should you make a noise to stop a deer before shooting him with a bow? 
yes, it depends on the situation, but if it's moving and there's not some big screaming reason not to, I'm, I'm going to stop. Okay. And I'm going to tailor this one slightly to Midwest farm country or just at least Midwest private farms. Cause I think that's the majority of people you can only scout one part of the season. Which would you pick winter, summer, or in season? Hmm. I have moved more and more to, um, what I'm going to tell you now, it used to be winter, but now I'm going to say in season. I've really, the last couple of years moved more and more to like, I just want to know what's happening now and adjust now. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's what I'm leaning towards now. Have you picked that up just from experience or talking with people like Andre DeQuisto, who's just preaches finding red hot sign? It's been a combo, you know, it's been like hearing from guys like that. And then, you know, then testing and trying those things out myself and the more, and then also like adopting a more mobile setup, right. I've I've really gotten into my saddle and sticks and I've gotten very comfortable with that. And so I've just found, I used to be really into scout, 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 and then prep a bunch of pre-hung stands and all that kind of stuff. And I, I just, I've actually found that was kind of holding me back in a lot of ways because you're kind of wedded to an idea like you scout this stuff you hang these preset stands based on what you thought was happening and then because you put all that time into trimming out sets and putting up permanent sets and all that you kind of feel obligated to stick with it or at least you're it becomes the easy option it becomes the default option and then you've got all these little whispers in the back of your mind pulling you to just well, just go to that spot you got already hung or just stay here it's all set up mm-hmm. but when you have none of that holding you back you have no reason not to pick the absolute best spot every day because you have to go on there and set something new anyway. So it might, might as well be in the best damn place. Sure. So um, I've really come to enjoy that and have found it to be working pretty well. Okay. Which state has the better hunters? And this is tailored to this conversation, <laughs> Michigan, Ohio, or Illinois? Easy answer, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Michigan for life. <laughs> sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, this one's, uh, obviously this is trail cam radio. So for the entire season, you can either have five standard trail cameras or two cell cameras. What's your pick and why? It's a great question. I like that a lot. Um, Hmm. Very good. Hmm. Man, I guess I can see a good reason for going either way. But I suppose I will take the two cell cameras just because, I mean, we all know the what cell cameras do for you. You can get that information instantaneously and you can get it without making any kind of impact. Um, so I, I love being low impact. So if I can do that and get some red hot fresh sign without ever needing to screw things up, it's hard to argue with that. I, I like, you know, having five cameras gives you a wider breadth. Um, but I think I would take the two cell cameras, low impact, instant information, and then use the other time that I'm saving from not hanging those others to, to glass, to observe, to do other things. Sure. Okay. This question comes from a level of endearment, but do you think you overanalyze bucks? Yes or no? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. Okay. (laughs) For sure. Okay. And then do you think that's a good or bad thing? Uh, I'm going to say that uh, sometimes it can be a bad thing, but it's also helped me sometimes. It's it's 50-50, right? Sometimes it helps. <laughs> sometimes it goes too far, but I will say it's a good thing for me because it's fun. Sure. Uh, like I, I really enjoy the like diving in deep and trying to figure out these bucks and like I just geek out mm-hmm. and that maybe is like my favorite, like the most fun thing of all that stuff. So even if it maybe keeps me from killing some of these deer <laughs> or makes it more difficult than it has to be. It's so much fun just to try to figure them out that I'm going to say it's, it's okay. Okay. All right. And then the almighty power question, um, you have, yeah. okay. I can take your hunting rights. You know, the, you know, the spiel. Yeah. Damn okay. you for taking away my hunting rights. <laughs> yeah. You need, uh, you need to shoot a five-year-old buck, um, where at and when. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go back to. I'm going to go back to one of my favorite old spots I used to hunt in Southern Ohio. And I'm going to be out there on November, November 7th. 
and I'm going to be setting up on this ridge that funnels off of, uh, it connects two blocks. I mean, it's stereotypical on spot, connects two big blocks of timber with great bedding on either side. Mm-hmm. I've got a narrow finger with a ridge system running up the top of it, running through the middle of it. And I'm going to be situated where there's travel that comes on actually either side of the ridge. And then a, there's a big section of like a generally primary scrape, little communication hub. And uh, I'll sit there all day, November 7th, and something's bound to come cruising through. And they're likely to stop. And even if they're not there for the scrape, they'll still stop for a half second and just give it a whiff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll send one right at them at 20 yards. Level of probability of that panning out. Like if you had to really reflect on it. How, just how- one day, I mean, <laughs> you know. But it's November 7th, which is yes, like November historically 7th, the best. It's a great day. Um, and I'm going to have a cold front and it's going to be just perfect. But even on those best of days, you know, it's still not that high a likelihood. Uh, but I'll give myself 23% chance. I'd take that any day. Take that any day in the deer woods. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, this is just something different here. I thought of this <clears throat> this morning. I'm going to pitch you a project, okay? And so for your next booker project, it's going to be called the Ultimate Big Buck Handbook for Hunting Pressured Whitetails. And you're going to take all of the basics that you're doing on the Wired to Hunt YouTube channel now, and then also take in snippets from past podcasts that really stand out to you on those different topics. Are you buying or selling this project? Oh, I'm buying that project because it's something we've very seriously considered doing before. <laughs> so, so yes, yes okay. to that. I, I equally agree. It's a good idea. <laughs> cool. All right. I'm going to say it was my idea. Now. I'm just kidding. Sure, we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you a little uh, royalty on it. <laughs> okay. No, I just, uh, yeah, that's cool. I mean, personally, I felt I followed your content for a super long time. Listen to the podcast in college and uh, it's just cool to, to talk to you here today. So appreciate your time. Yeah. Chad, do you have anything else here? No, I think uh, just maybe some parting words or advice to um, for anyone that's, I guess, inspired to take a similar career path um, that you've chosen. Hmm. Yeah, career stuff. I mean, I think the biggest thing would be, I guess it's, 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 it's like a three-part answer, I suppose. It'd be number one, if you're really, truly passionate about this kind of stuff, um, I would absolutely encourage anyone to pursue that because life's too short to be doing something you're miserable with. So chase it, chase whatever that dream is, number one, because it is possible. If you're willing to, you know, if you're willing to say failure is not an option, it's possible. And, and that was always my take. I said, I'm going to find some way to do this. Plan A might not work, plan B might not work, but I'll have a C and if C doesn't work, I'll do D. And if D doesn't work, I'll make E work. So I would, for whatever it's worth, that's what's worked for me as I've, I've chosen to Quit's not an option. Failure is not an option. I will find a way. I love this stuff so much. Find a way. So I'd encourage folks to, to believe in themselves on that front. I'd secondly say that once you have that belief and that um, ambition, then it's a matter of finding like what's your lane within this world. And don't feel, don't feel like just because you've seen someone else do this one thing that that's what you should do too. It's, it's really about finding like what the right fit is for you personally. So if you are great at talking, uh, but you can't write a damn word, don't feel like you need to try to be a writer just because everybody seems to get their start as a whitetail writer or whatever it might be. Like find what your specialty is, find what makes you disproportionately unique, uh, you know, find that thing and then craft it and polish it and learn, like learn, 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 learn. My big thing when I got into this world was I kind of found out the thing I wanted to do but I had no right to do it. I had no skill set. I had no experience. I had no education in this kind of thing. I had zero education in writing, in communication, in video, in podcast, none of it. I went to school and I got a business degree. Um, but I found out that I had like a love for those things. And so I decided to create my own like college course of sorts that I've been going through over the last 15 years, trying to learn how to get better. So I've watched all these, you know, YouTube videos about how to learn how to podcast and how to edit podcasts and how I learned, taught myself photography, taught myself videography, taught myself how to edit video, taught myself how to write. And there's all that information out there. So if you find the thing that you're really interested in, you think you've got 
some kind of, you know, um, ability to do, then just craft, like, like work on your craft, really work on it. And then finally do the thing and put it out there. And, you know, for me, it's like being a content creator. Um, so in my case, it was like, make my thing, do my thing, even if it's shit, put it out to the world, share it. And then, you know, see what people think. How can, what can you learn from this? Maybe some people do like it. Maybe some people don't like it. So I, my thing was, I found my thing. I really tried hard to keep crafting and keep crafting, like perfecting my craft for years and years and years. And I just kept putting it out, putting it out, putting it out, sharing, 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 help other people, share, 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 help other people, share, share, share. Um, and eventually that leads to opportunities. Uh, your thing might be starting a business like you guys, building a product, whatever that might be. You got to put out like an MVP, like a minimal viable product. You got to put something into the world. So you guys had to launch that first trail camera. And I'm sure that first trail camera you put out there wasn't the ultimate camera you wanted. You probably were like, God, in the perfect world, it'd be a little bit different, but you had to put something out there to get started. So you got to get started, get feedback, keep going. Um, And I think it's super duper horribly cliche, but anything is possible if you're uh, willing to chase in that kind of way. So that's, that's my hot take on that one. It's good. Hot take. Yeah, indeed. I think it's, it's, uh, it's all of it's so accurate. <laughs> you literally, there's no, there's no magic secret sauce. It's literally just doing the work and continuing to hone your craft. Yeah. Um, and that's seems to be a, a commonality with a lot of people we talk with. Yeah. So awesome. Well, we certainly appreciate your time. This was fun. Uh, you survived your own <laughs> torture chamber basically. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we I certainly, we appreciate it. You're welcome. It was a great idea to put me through. I'm glad that I can now say that I've, I've went through it. Uh, I probably should have put myself through that first before making other <laughs> folks do it. So now I feel better about putting people into it. <laughs> awesome. Well, we will, uh, we'll link to everything that you have going on and uh, certainly appreciate it. And any uh, closing remarks here? I'll just thank you guys. I appreciate the opportunity. It's fun to get to catch up and uh, appreciate you following everything that Wired Hunt's doing and launching a whole lot of stuff this year. So hopefully there's a little something for everyone.